Right, we're going to finish up this chapter now on making a just ecological society. And we're starting with togetherness and the dialogue of solidarities. So back to Androcles and the Lion again. That dialogue of solidarities was um, that mutual aid, that connection and sentiment for each other, that type of thing. So why did the lion spare Androcles in the ring? And why did Androcles pull the thorn from the lion's paw? Well, the reason was that Androcles and the lion were moved by that very narrow self-interest, rational self-interest that we just talked about uh, could be so problematic in the tragedy of the, of the commons. So they were <clears throat> moved by more than that narrow self-interest. Uh, and they were moved as well by sentiments, okay? So Androcles for the lion in pain, horrible pain, and the lion for a friend and former companion when he ran into him in the Circus Maximus, okay? So Androcles had certain uh, commitment, he had a commitment to certain norms of behavior. And removing the nail and, or the thorn that was causing so much pain and cleaning the wound, you know, just seemed like the right thing to do to him because of the norms that he grew up with. You help if something's in pain. The lion had these sentiments for someone who had helped him, for a friend and companion. And it's so cute in the movie when you see them recognize each other when he's you know, the lion's supposed to kill uh, uh, Androcles. So this, those sentimental connections that they had, or commitments, in turn, led to their own self-interests, right? Although, and this is the key point, they could not have known it at the time. They could not have known it at the time. They never could have known at the time, certainly Androcles, that he took the risk to remove the thorn from the lion's paw. And I suppose one could say that the, that the lion, in a sense, took a risk or certainly stepped beyond its boundaries to befriend Androcles. They never would have known that there would have come a time down the road when it would have saved both of them to have been, to have had that those sentimental um, commitments to one another when they wound up in the Circus Maximus. Okay. So this is the crucial point of the criticism of the tragedy in the commons and the quote, rational actor model. That is that sentiments can promote interests, but it doesn't ever reduce them. At the same time, interests can promote sentiments which is a big part of the reason that Androcles and the lion liked each other is that they'd learn to rely on each other to promote each other's needs and interests, right? I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, um, turnabout's fair play. We have all kinds of, you know, language for that in our, in our society and in, in all societies. So because they helped each other, they liked each other and they shared a sense of commitment. The story is another example of dialogue as well, and that's the dialogue of solidarities, which creates a lasting sense of togetherness. That's kind of what solidarity means. So mutual commitment and mutual aid in the social ecology is what came out of those uh, solidarities. The word solidarities is used here in the plural, uh, because the dialogue's based on mutually supporting bases of commitment. There's two bases there, two bases, right? A solidarity of interests and a solidarity of sentiments. So the interests of both, Androcles and the lion, were served through their relationship, but there were also these sentimental ties of affection and common norms. Uh, the common norms would be you, you help someone in pain, and for the lion, you don't eat someone who helped you, you know. All this emphasis on sentiment uh, sounds, I'm sure, to, to some of you very idealistic or too idealistic. 
it's a kind of rare altruism. Um, certainly with Androcles and Lion, it was rare. Um, but sentiments are often, uh, they're, they're very common and they're very necessary. The example that they talk about in the text is domestic partners, okay, is a good example. So as you may have very different interests than your partner and different needs than your partner, but as long as you can coordinate the different interests, it can work, right? It works quite well often. The important thing is not that their interests are the same, but they are complementary, okay? And they're able to work with what needs to be done for those complementary interests. And so they use the example of a musician and a school teacher. Well, a musician has to stay up really late at night generally, and a school teacher has to get up really early. So you use those complementary roles. Uh, you know, the school teacher's home with the kids at, at, at night and, you know, that who can pick up the kids when or you make dinner tonight or whatever, those types of things. OK, they're complementary. So how do they know that that's going to work, that they'll be there for each other? I'm sure some of you have had this experience where it did work, those complementary roles and where it didn't work with domestic partners. OK, so how do you know they'll be there for each other's needs? Showing up on time can be relied upon, et cetera, et cetera. The answer to that question is trust. So we're back to trust again, okay? Trust can exist because each believes the relationship is based on more than just a calculation of self-interest. That wouldn't be much of a relationship, would it? Although there's many relationships like that, like rich old men with gorgeous young trophy wives, as they're called. That That is a, usually, not always, I mean, often there's a lot of affection and love, but often it's also a relationship based purely on the calculation of self-interests, okay? Uh, so each has affection for the other and a commitment to the norms held in common with both and without trust, right? Without a solidarity of sentiments, gives it, there's no solidarity of interest that can live, can survive very long. So you need the solidarity of sentiments to support the solidarity of interests. With just a solidarity or togetherness of interests, it doesn't last that long because the interests can change so dramatically, right? Okay. And the reverse works as well, okay? The persistence of interests is one of the main ways that each partner senses affection and common norms of commitment from the other. So it's a give and take, goes back and forth. You need them both, but sentiments are crucially, crucially important. So to return to the tragedy of the commons, one of the main reasons that the herders on the common land, the herders on common land usually keep from overgrazing, usually the ones who do, is that they trust one another. They're their neighbors, they're often family and kin, extended family as well, okay? So dialogue in the everyday sense of the term is dialogue as communication. And here is the key point to this whole subject of mobilizing in a, a just society. Communication means the mobilization of knowledge and all the social relations associated with it. I love that, the mobilization of, of knowledge, getting knowledge to be moving and active okay, and useful. So from the cultivation of knowledge, from growing knowledge, gardening knowledge, we can gain identification with the norms and commitments and with sentiments. We learned our norms, right? We learn values. We, we learn what commitments we have. We learn the sentiments we, of the people we connect with, right? And we also therefore gain this identification with where our interests lie, okay? So neither interests nor sentiments are givens. They're, they don't just automatically happen, right? Um, they're created. They're created and they're also often hopefully recreated as we grow 
and cultivate knowledge and learn. Uh, and that's through our interaction with others and the world. So school, for instance, where you are, is an interaction with others and the world that may be different from your previous ones. But that is exactly how those interests and sentiments grow and morph, change, are created, are recreated, right? So if the paradox of collective behavior is that people often do not act in their own interests when they act in their own interests, or one could say when they think they're acting in their own interests, right? Uh, the solution is clear. I love this. Also act on your sentiments. Don't just act on what you perceive at the moment, at the time, to be your self-interests, right? Also act on sentiments. Act on both. If you can't find a way to act on both, then you probably shouldn't act in that manner, okay? Because remember, when we act in our self-interest, we often are not acting down the road because we cannot foresee we are fun, often are not acting in our own self-interests, okay? So environmental justice depends on heartfelt commitment to mutual aid, okay? That's the whole reason Androcles and the lion is in here, mutual aid, okay? We help each other, and in helping each other, we develop this both interests and sentiments, so uh, if you, they're going to talk here briefly about the Berber people, uh, they like to be called the Abaz again in the Atlas Mountains. I'm going to, uh, I, I put up a video for you about them. I couldn't find one specifically about their herding, but at least you get a visual of what they look like and what the Atlas Mountains look like. Uh, so there's two villages that the text talks about. They're about 13 kilometers apart. And they use a system of the uh, collective management of grading, grazing yet grazing lands. Traditionally, they've used that system that we talked about earlier, the commons, common grazing lands, right? So these two villages that they describe in the text have been using this method for hundreds of years, if, if not longer. But in one of the villages, that system of using common grazing lands um, fairly, justly, is breaking down. Uh, the grass isn't in good shape anymore. Much of the land has been privatized. Uh, the richer people give grazing rights to their buddies, sound familiar, and not others. And people are now angry with each other in a village that used to be have camaraderie and be united. But in the other village of the two that they're discussing in the book, the grass is still in great shape. People like each other. They get together and dance and sing most evenings, um, hang out together. But in that first village we talked about, that doesn't happen anymore, right? They're just the village that's privatizing. Okay. So what's the difference between the two villages? Well, it's pretty simple, really. The Moroccan government wants to modernize, right? And it's been working to, quote, develop uh, the local economy by promoting tourism. Okay. And along with that, they've also promoted privatizing a lot of the communal land. And that's why now there's some people that are richer than others, you know, in the other village and that type of thing. But in the other village, although they've heard of all of those things, oh, and there's a lot of satellite dishes in the village that's privatized our land and that type of thing. So they're getting information from, you know, other places as well. But in the other village, they've heard about that stuff. They heard about the satellite dishes. You know, they've heard about privatization of land, but they kind of only occasionally toyed with them and they haven't ever adopted them seriously. And they still sing and dance together and they still have a dialogue and have solidarities, right, togetherness. Uh, and those solidarities are to ensure environmental justice for each other, and the grass is still green in their village. So the question is, how big is your solidarity? 
How big is our solidarity? Can we create solidarity with those that don't speak and that are non-human? Remember, this class is about environmentalism and ecology. So in Appian's uh, parable of Androcles and the lion, that parable is to tell us, yes, we can. We can have solidarity with non-human critters, definitely. Okay, And so does the philosopher Bruno Latour says, yes, we can in his actor network theory. So one of the basic tenets of the actor network theory, or actants as Latour calls them, we talked about this before, is that they, those actors or actants extend beyond the human. And, they, and because they extend the, beyond the human, they create this much broader collective, uh, and this is what he calls them, a coalition that he calls a collective. Okay. But this collective togetherness isn't always or even necessarily symmetrical. Okay. It isn't even. Because it's true that humans, that, or excuse me, that non-humans have interests and sentiments and formulations of trust. That's true. They do. If you've had a dog that you love dearly and loves you dearly, you know that, right? The very nice relationship. <laughs> of sentiment and caring for one another, okay? So we know that non-humans can do that. And you can look on YouTube and find all kinds of videos of people with lions and tigers and, you know, apes and all kinds of critters that just, you know, where they have this intense, deep relationship or different species for each other, you know, that type of thing. So they have ways of communicating their interests, their sentiments, their trusts, and, and once again, um, because I love dogs and have dogs, I, I relate that to dogs. They definitely communicate their interests, you know, when they want to eat, when they want to go out, that type of thing. But what about things like butterflies or rocks, soil, grass, trees, etc.? Is that part of the collective? In that case, interests and settlements, sentiments, excuse me, have to be and trust have to be in our part of the collective, in the human part of the collective. We have to be the ones to express interest, sentiments, and trust towards those things that are not living as we see them so much. Okay. Because or are non-articulate, can't express it in any way. Although if you really think about it, Certainly, if you garden, you know, plants very much express their, their needs, at least, you know. Watch what happens to a plant if you don't water it, okay? And watch what happens when you do. So, you know, rocks are a different situation than that. But nonetheless, we have to be more observant and more caring and have more of those feelings to things that can't directly let us know what their needs and, and interests and sentiments and, and gain our trust. So... Um, the way that it's suggested that we think about those other things, uh, because we don't communicate, we are not able to communicate with non-articulate actors in our collective, is that rather than thinking of them as actors, we think of them as dancers who prompt each other. That's, a, that's also a lovely metaphor to think about. And the idea of prompt here is meant to represent the influence of nature's dynamics, right? How it works, okay? And its practices. But no one's claiming that those things are determined by influences. They're just the way nature operates, okay? So in other words, an actor or actant does not have to be able to speak to be part of the environmental movement. That Larger collective, the whole larger collective, from mammalian animals to reptilian critters to marsupials to rocks, trees, oceans, that's all part of the collective. Now, the next section here is looking at how do we mobilize ecological contestations, okay? So everything we've talked about 
up to this point, a cultivation of knowledge, dialogue, real conscientization, having real consciences, not top-down monologic and public relations type of, of discussions and consciences, but real ones. And the connections of interests and sentiments and trust, we've talked about all of that. You would think, and that was a lot, a lot to talk about, a lot to think about, a lot to absorb. You'd think that, that all that represented a successful grassroots environmental movement, but nope, it is not that easy because you can have all of that, the sentiments, the interests, the dialogue, etc., cetera, uh, and the trust, but... What if your movement's trying to do something that threatens the government or a corporate interests, the powers that be, right, in the broader community, and they really don't want to see you succeed, right? What if other, and why? Because it affects their interests. So what if others' interests and sentiments lead them in different directions, okay? What if they want you and your environmental concerns to just go away, okay? They just shut up and go away. Here's another point. If everyone agreed with what you want to see done, it would already be done. So already you've got a contest, right? Contestation. Okay. And this leads us to the sociology of contestation. How environmental movements successfully overcome resistance and in overcoming that resistance, they sometimes, not always, but sometimes broaden the sense of togetherness rather than separateness. Okay. And that idea of contestation is called double politics. Double politics. And, politi and the political opportunity structure. And here your book starts talking about Saul Alinsky, who was one of the very first practically invented grassroots organizing, right? And uh, uh, Sinclair Lewis, Lewis wrote a novel uh, in the 1930s called The Jungle, and it was about the Chicago stockyards and the neighborhood that was surrounding the stockyards and in part of it. Um, and it was called the Back of the Yards neighborhood. And that's where Saul Alinsky started organizing. And I put a video up about that for you. Okay, so that neighborhood back of the yards, you can back of the stockyards, had appalling health conditions, as you might imagine, poor housing, disorganized social life that often accompanies, you know, the disenfranchised and the poor wherever they live. And um, Alinsky was was probably the first social justice he catalyzed. The first, what well, was probably the first social justice movement, uh, in because he helped the people themselves back of, in the back of the yard set up the back of the yard's neighborhood council. So that it was the first social justice movement and really the first major grassroots organizing. So local people organized cleanup of the stockyards, they built homes, they developed local businesses, and they were instrumental in founding the National School Lunch Program. Isn't that interesting? Okay. And that council is still growing strong. The video I put up is, shows you some historical footage, but it, <coughs> it also shows you modern footage of what the council is doing. Uh, so Alinsky's most famous quote as one of the first, you know, grassroots organizers is change means movement, movement means friction, change can't occur without friction or conflict. In other words, now this is all Alinsky's perspective because we're going to get, we're having a refutation to Alinsky's perspective here in a moment, but right now we're just talking about Alins Alinsky's perspective or conflict, you know, change can't occur without friction or conflict. In other words, Grassroots, grassroots movements can't escape friction of one kind or another. If something's worth doing and hasn't been done, there are most likely some very powerful interests standing in the way. That is true, okay, and that is true today. Okay. 
And if so, it won't be easy. So, and actually, as Alinsky said, anything worth doing usually isn't easy or it would already be done. So, and here's his powerful statement and the way he felt and thought coming to the fore. So be ready to embrace conflict. That was one of his major concepts. Be ready to embrace conflict. Be ready for the sit-in march, the confrontation, the rough treatment. That was all Alinsky's method and message. And by the way, if you, on YouTube, there are many videos um, about Alinsky and his philosophy, if you're, if you're interested. However, other organizers do worry about this very con conflict-based approach because it can be both off-putting and dangerous to potential allies. Okay. So what many environmental uh, sociologists and grassroots movement leaders think is maybe a better strategy is to try to change things change the minds of those in power who make the laws, who write the rules, instruct the police, etc. So change, trying to change minds rather than a model of contestation and consensus based, uh, rather than contest or contestation, conflict, using a consensus based approach. Who's right? Uh, which way is in fact most successful? Well, that's another dialogue. You, they both have, they, they are both present, right? You have to do both. Vinegar and honey, good and bad to both approaches, okay? <clears throat> both consensus, every, trying to get everybody to agree, trying to change minds, and conflict have their place. And most organizing includes some of both, as I just said. So what, this is what is called the double politics of, content state, of contestation. Uh, you got to stand up for yourself. It's going to cause friction. It's going to cause conflict. But you also have to try at the same time to develop some connection and some sentiment and con some consensus building with people. Okay. So a grassroots movement begins by analyzing the what's called the political opportunity structure. What's going to be there in the in the political structure that can be opportunities and what will you contend with as a grassroots movement to obtain your goals in that political opportunity structure? So in other words, strategy, right? And this that form of analysis can help explain why some uh, environmental, mo environmental movements uh, have been extremely successful, actually. Uh, and the example they give you is the nuclear, the um, anti-nuclear power movement. That's, that's been quite successful. Whereas others, like the um, climate change movement in the United States, you know, have gained less traction. Another point about conflict and contestation is that it unfolds historically. So the conflict approach of, approach of today even if it's only reasonably successful, the marching and the, you know, all of that, sit-ins, okay, it might only be reasonably successful, but it can lay the foundation for the consensus building approach of the next generation, you know, or in the next 10 years or whatever, the next political shift, whatever. So conflict can lay the foundation. Conflict, we're not talking about wars and, you know, fighting. We're talking about marches, sit-ins, etc., that type of thing. Okay. So double, what, what it's about, this idea of double politics and political strategy is getting a face, gaining a face in the dialogue of decision-making, becoming an active player. To do that, obviously, you can't just be all nicey-nicey and consensus building. That's important, talking to people, making connections with people. And, and political entities and organizations. But it's also important to be visible, which is more marching and, you know, that type of thing. So what are the pros and cons of the three cons that we started out with here? 
which seems like ages ago. So the success of the Iowa Sustainable Farmers Group shows that bringing together the three cons of conceptions, connections, and contestations can actually be pros, okay? So the main thing is togetherness itself. The three words actually derive from the together of con, okay? Conception means to put together. Connection means to tie together. And contestation means to bear witness together. So environmental movements that are successful have been the result of many, many, many diverse things, okay? Uh, that, and they're often, in fact, usually only understood after the fact, right? You might have a charismatic person uh, to lead them, okay? Um, I'm not thinking of environmental movements right now, but once again, think about Gandhi or ML, Martin Luther King, you know, in a movement, a charismatic person is extremely, can be extremely important to mobilize people. Uh, or there can be extreme change in the culture or the environment. And we're seeing both of those things happen now. We call it the culture wars, don't we? The country is pretty much divided over cultural issues. And the environment's part of the cultural issues as well. So things can happen that shift things in, in just time. So what that's called is a dialogue of providence. Providence what shows up, whether that's a charismatic leader, uh, the climate, you know, the earth, you know, the, the warming of the earth, uh, the, you know, increased hurricanes on and on, fires, you know, all of those things are providential. You don't know that they're going to happen. And so it's not luck so much, but situational opportunities that provide for both agency and change in, in, grassroots movements and, you know, environmental movements. The reason isn't just, you know, the reason it's not just luck is that we can actually help create situations that allow for those opportunities. We can't exactly predict what they'll be or when they'll appear or how they will turn out, but we can help create the situations. And the skill of a grassroots organization is in doing that, in creating a situation through uh, the cultivation of knowledge, for instance, uh, as much as it is in acting upon the opportunities. So, uh, the, like the grassroots farmers of Iowa did, the, the grassroots organization, Practical Farmer, Farmers of Iowa did, by simply inviting people to a meeting out of all places, considering what they were meeting about, sustainable agriculture, they just invited people to come to a meeting and talk about this stuff out of all places, a McDonald's restaurant. 